But now it's my chat with singer-songwriter Gloria Estefan. Hello. Hello. Uh, welcome back. Lovely to see you. Oh, it's lovely to see you. Always, always. <laughs> Through the years, we've seen each other a we few have. times. Yes, we, we have. We have. Uh, so this is um, exciting. It's finally happening. Yes. We've talked about it before, but now it's real. <laughs> it is real and happening. Thank <laughs> on the Your Lord. Feet is arriving. It opens on June the 3rd in Leicester. Now, was it always going to open in Leicester at the Curve? Yes. We oh, wanted okay. to have, first of all, the Curve is amazing. That, that uh, space is just so incredibly unique. Yeah. And people walking by can see what's going on backstage. So we always like to have a trial run of it before you hit the, you know, the big one, the yeah. West End. We did it in uh, the States. We went to Chicago for a month and and then made some changes before we hit Broadway. Because you've seen it a lot now and it's been going for, uh, you know, a few years. Yes. Do you have distance from it? Can you watch the story as a story or does it still, do you still kind of have moments of going, oh God, this bit again? Well, those moments always are going to come. But uh, funny enough, I mean, it was really kind of strange and weird at the beginning uh, to realize that this is Emilio's and my life up there. And I remember the very first table read that him and I, you know, we were fine. We'd never been in this situation before. So we're figuring, oh, this is going to be, you know, like technical and we're going to be hearing the different voices. <clears throat> and the first time I heard, because I, I, you know, I hadn't heard it been done. I'd read the script and worked with Alex Stinelaris and we we're so blessed to have him Oscar yeah, yeah. winner. Thank God he won the Oscar after. Or we <laughs> couldn't have afforded him. But, uh, they put the one of the first songs I ever wrote for Miami Sound Machine uh, called When Someone Comes Into Your Life. Uh, they put it in the voice of my father, uh, Alex. And his voice, the man, Eliseo, that played my dad on Broadway, was one of those voices that reaches into your heart. And all of a sudden, I started welling up and I nod in my throat and I go, oh, no, 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 please don't do this. So I looked to Emilio for support and he was crying like a baby already. <laughs> So it was very emotional at times, and uh, I have an interesting story, actually. After my accident, um, I would have to talk myself into getting out of bed every day, and I woke up one morning, I'd had this phenomenal dream of a play, a Broadway musical, and Emilio walks in, and I said to him, I mean, you got to realize this is 1990, I say to him, babe, I've just had this dream where I dreamed an entire Broadway play and I was hearing this music. It was Latin. This is before we'd done Mi Tierra album. I go, it was Latin. I wish I could write right now like everything that I heard. But the weird thing is it was our music, but I was sitting in the front row watching it. And he said, wow, what a strange thing. So when we were in Chicago, I used to sit at all these different you know, parts of the theater so I could see how everybody was going to yeah, yeah, feel yeah. the play. And I, one day, finally, I go, let me sit in the front row to see how it feels like you're spitting distance from these people. And when I sat there, they were doing the Mi Tierra number and the, that dream came back to me. And I go, I, this was what I dreamed. I was sitting in the front row watching this musical yeah. on our lives 30 some years later. And it threw me into that dream. Like, this was it. That's crazy, so I isn't it? kind of dreamed. I've been yeah. a little psychic through my life. So I guess this was one of those moments. It was really freakish. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I, it's always interesting to see grown men crying. I'd be in the back yeah. and I'd see the glistening, you know, tears. And I love But that. also we can see it's odd because I think sometimes if you do one of these um, uh, musicals or shows or even a film of somebody's life, they have to kind of, I don't know, like beat it into a dramatic shape. Yes, they but do. But because you have these pivotal moments in your life you know meeting your husband yep. uh, the accident the, the, all that it's sort of it, it's crying yeah. out to be dramatized there's been drama yes <laughs> we've had drama although it's funny because you know in my life it's just you overcome one more thing and that's why Alex Dinelaris chose to call it on your feet and the focus has been he said throughout your lives you've constantly had to get back on your feet until literally I had to after that accident. Yeah. And I remember that song would get thrown back at me, all my fans after the accident saying, you've got to get on your feet. Like they were being clever. And I'm going, okay, thank you. <laughs> Why did I record this song at this moment? <laughs> and then uh, that's just it that you, you know, and, and that's what we wanted to portray with the show. We wanted to move people emotionally. Sure, you entertain them and whoever wants yeah. to go for the fun and the dancing, it's great. But uh, we want them to go home with a 
you know, with a thought like, uh, you know, if there's something you haven't done that, that you wanted to, maybe you want to take it up, you know, or if you've had, you know, tough times with your family, maybe, you know, don't waste time. Like we want them to take home messages and take them on an emotional journey as well. And also what I like about the story, it's a romance, but it's not a fairy tale romance. This no. is a real marriage. Yes, you it know. is. Uh, 40 years now we've been married. Oh, hats and off to you. He was my first and only, I told you uh, a while back. And that was just coincidental. I didn't plan to get married. I wasn't even thinking about marriage. I'd taken care of my dad for so long. I wanted to have fun and and I wanted to study. I was going to go to Sorbonne in France and study international law and diplomacy. And then I met Emilio for fun. I joined the band and he had an older girlfriend at the time. So it's <laughs> not like, well, yeah. Yeah, 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 he was 22 yeah. and she was 36. Wow. Yeah. So I didn't, to me, he was like this big man. He's only four and a half years older than me, but... <laughs> Uh, he was my boss, and I never thought we didn't want to mix things because things were going so well. So yeah, it's it's been a a true journey and wonderful, really, and fast. And one of the things I fascinated because you know you were the singer with Miami Sound Machine. Da, da, da. When did you take top billing? When then? When did it become Gloria Estefan? Well, it it happened uh, after the second album because what was happening was, and it wasn't my idea. I I did not want to do it. I fought Emilio Tooth and Nail. And I said, we have a brand. We have a brand. It's Miami Sound Machine. And he goes, no, this is what's happening. They're offering you things like I, uh, they offered me to do a duet with Placido Domingo and to be on this album based on the life of Goya. And he goes, what are we going to put, Placido Domingo and the girl from Miami Sound Machine? And he goes, <laughs> people, you're the focus. He goes, people focus on you. And we, I want people to know your name because you're the one. So he was the one that added my name. And then, you know, uh, when he was the last member in the original band, uh, then he said, let's just use your name. You know, uh, Miami Sound Machine always travels with me and they, they're they there. Yeah. But he was really Miami Sound Machine, Emilio. Yeah. Uh, people have been in touch. Uh, Michael in Canuck. Uh, oh, hello. I'm going on holiday to Orlando this August. Oh. Quite hot in August. I thought. Yes. Uh, I'd like to visit your hotel in Vero Beach. How, oh, I like that. He does. He's like to go a hotel in Vero Beach, but how often are you there? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what do you recommend I do while I'm there? Are you involved in the hotel? Of course. Uh, we're hands-on to all our businesses, and we're very involved in the in the design. I mean, we've traveled all over the world, so... You know we, a nice hotel. We know that you want to have a fabulous mattress, wonderful sheets, because, you know, you, you're sleeping. You want it to be a great experience. A great shower with a lot of pressure, really good room temperature control, and clean, and a place to put your bags so we, Emilio and I really were very involved in the design and we Vero Beach to me is like stepping back in time when I was a kid in Miami it's a beautiful place environmentally I don't get there as often as I wish believe me we have yeah. a home there and that's my favorite place on earth going there but it's very environmentally conscious so if he's going in August the turtle season they're still being born. So you can take these tours where they take you early in the morning and you are, can see hatchlings of sea turtles being born in the hotel. Many people have seen them because late at night, sometimes the little turtles have gone in the wrong direction. They're, they don't let you put lights towards the beach half of the year while the turtles are nesting. So you you literally could see a giant sea turtle come up to the shore behind the hotel and uh, dig a nest. It takes like a two-hour time period and then in by August they're already being born they the nests are born two months later so that's a great thing to see they have wonderful fishing if you like right behind the hotel there is a reef with a sunken ship from the 1800s that you can snorkel because it's not that deep um, there's so many wonderful things to do you're an hour and a half from Orlando you can see the Space Center in Cooks, yeah. uh, in Cocoa Beach. There's a lot of great stuff. And tell me this, was it a, an existing hotel that you renovated or was it, was it a brand new thing? It was a hotel made in 1972. So it, it oh. was a Howard Johnson's. It wasn't cute. It needed cute. work. Oh, my God. <laughs> but when we bought it, we were just going to remodel. And we got hit by two back-to-back -back hurricanes, Gene and Francis. So we literally took the hotel down to the concrete and built it brand new. So it is like it's like a new hotel. You can't build new things there. There's a say, this is making me nervous. It's like drama follows you. Yeah. Like there's going to be a fire in Logan yeah. House while no, you're here. No, no, there's not. <laughs> Please no. I've been very fortunate though. Drama follows everybody. I've had good outcomes. <laughs> That's true. Drama. That's true. You've turned drama into exactly. comedy. It's all good. It's been good. Uh, Trisha in Huddersfield. Who is Noel the bulldog? I'm guessing your bulldog. 
I had Noel. Uh, oh. Noel passed in 2012, but she uh, was the gift that keeps on giving. I did two books based on her. The two children's books, they were New York Times bestsellers. I just finished the third one, uh, still, Noel and Lulu. And Noel was such a special dog that I... I knew that she was going to be special for a lot of people and a lot of children throughout the United States. Their teachers use the books as teaching material. She was a magical dog. I still miss her. I still have her on my kitchen window along with her three kids because bulldogs don't have long, long lifespans. I had her for 10 years. But she's still in my heart and in my writing and continues to inspire. She was a very special bulldog. Oh. Um, Paul from Redditch, true or false, the CIA approached you to work for them? I mean, if you are working for them, probably don't talk about it. But uh... Well, think about this. It's the best cover I could possibly have. Yes. That's what I tell my family. I go, you don't know. <laughs> my mom had a fit. They did indeed invite me to be in the CIA when I was 18, that I was working at Customs and Immigration. And those guys were undercover and they they thought that I was an amazing, uh, you know, asset. So... They approached me and, you know, you don't know really because, I mean, I do get to speak to world leaders all the time. Maybe you should play some of my songs backwards or (laughs) maybe secret messages have been sent throughout the world in my songs. You you set off the metal detector when you came (laughs) in? Uh, She packing? (laughs) Well, I might have because of the rods in my back, but no, they're they're non-magnetic. They're titanium. (laughs) Titanium reinforced. Uh, How important was the inspirational track coming out of the dark to you and your husband? That's from Catherine Shelms. Well, I'll tell you this. When I was being transported from Scranton, which is where they took me when we had the accident, to New York, I was in one medevac helicopter with the doctor that had flown from New York because he had to prepare me. It was a really big risk to move me, but it was a bigger risk to leave me because they'd never done that operation there. And then Emilio was in a separate helicopter with my son. And it was a very gray day. He was worried even about flying because, uh, you know, it wasn't the best weather. But somehow there was one ray of light that kept hitting him in the eye. And uh, he grabbed a piece of paper on the helicopter and he wrote the words coming out of the dark, thinking, how long is it going to be before we come out of this darkness? He literally went gray in two months after that accident. Wow. His hair went completely gray. So that's a true thing that can happen. And... Three months after when we were home, he had not left my side and he knew that music was very healing. So he said, look, today I was going through the toll booth and I reached into my pocket to get a coin and I found this crumpled paper washed many times over. And I remember that day and I wrote these words on a piece of paper. I'd love for you to come to the studio maybe and work on this song with me. So it was the first outing I ever made from my home. We went to the studio. I went for him because I wanted to do something for him. Yeah, yeah. I sat down, John Cicada was there, and John sang me the melody of just those words. That's all they had done. And I sat there, and it was like this outpouring of thankfulness to the people that sent so many prayers my way. And we wrote that song in 15 minutes, and that's what it is. It's a very big thank you to everyone that took time out of their day and went to their place of worship and sent me letters and cards, which I have every one of them. I have saved all of them. And they are on the stage. Uh, The letters that you're going to see in one of the scenes of the show are actual letters copied from the originals. And the ones that they read are actual letters that people sent me. And how hard was that after a big accident like that, just to get the strength back in your voice, you know, to to breathe into your lungs and and not, you know, because presumably your breathing becomes quite shallow because you're in pain and all those sorts of things. A lot of pain. Well, I wrote the song then, but I didn't record it till months later. Oh, okay. And uh, at that point I had been doing rehab like six, seven hours a day. But funny enough... Uh, I think that it that accident helped my singing because it made me far more communicative. And I learned about the power of prayer and not in a religious way, just the connectivity that we have. And that's to me what prayer is. People focusing on a, on a you know, one thing with positive energy. And I just, uh, I grew from it. I grew so much from that experience. I wouldn't want to go through it again, I'll no. tell you that. Yeah. But I wouldn't change it. Honestly. And presumably it makes you much more conscious of the technicality of singing because you're learning all of that again. Yes. Well, fortunately, I had a great teacher that I started late in life because I couldn't afford this before. But at 23, I, I had a wonderful uh, coach. And she had already taught me how yeah, to use okay. my breath and the diaphragm and everything. But yeah, it was pretty painful <laughs> just to move 
for many, many months. Uh, Daniel Wimbledon, I've already seen On Your Feet on Broadway. It was amazing. I'm looking forward to seeing it in London in August. Congratulations on a great show. But Uh many people will be asking this. When might we see you perform live here in the UK? Ah. It's been ages. It has been ages, ages, ages. They're trying to get me back out there on the road. I've got an album coming out that... It's kind of like a reimagining of a lot of our hits as if I had been born in Brazil. So Conga is now Samba. There's four new songs on it. And I've done a Spanish version of Here We Are that I wrote now for this album. So there will be reason to get back out there. I would also love, and if I can convince her, it'd be awesome to have Emily open up for me in a slew of shows because our daughter is the best musician of all of us. So we might see some shows. I mean, I don't think I'll ever do a whole giant world tour because like I told my husband, I didn't work that hard to work that hard, if you know what I mean. (laughs) But uh, to get back out there and and, uh, see, you know, re-cement that relationship, we might see some shows maybe next year. Yeah, We're out of time. Uh, Just uh, Let's just remind everybody. Yes, we are. You've got, you're a busy woman. Oh my God. You're busier than me. (laughs) You've got more life to live. Oh my God. There's a sequel to the musical. (laughs) Uh, The new Broadway musical, On Your Feet. It's uh, June the 3rd. It'll be in Leicester at the Curve Theatre. And then, and uh, June the 14th on August the 31st, it's at the London Coliseum. And then whip work away on a UK tour. Birmingham, Plymouth, Nottingham, Sunderland, Edinburgh, Cardiff, Manchester, ending in Belfast in November. Gloria Estefan, always an enormous, enormous pleasure. Thank I love talking so to you. Thank you so much. And by the way, I have to say this because I've already seen the British cast. They are incredible. And some of the things that they did with the material with it blew me away. It, I unexpected, you know, different kinds of approaches to what I've seen a million times. And I'm so excited for the audience in Britain to see their own Brits playing a bunch of Cubans. So it's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Gloria. Thank you.